Hello to everyone in the US, Israel, Palestine, and other places in the world. Welcome to this latest installment of Conversations with Israel and Palestine, hosted by Partners for Progressive Israel. Conversations with Israel and Palestine is a series of informational webinars that brings voices from Israel and Palestine to an American audience, providing an important link between progressives in the US and in the Middle East. My name is Kayla rothman Zecker, and over the next 60 minutes, I'll be serving as a discussion moderator. I've worked for most of the past decade in Israel-Palestine and the United States on refugee-related issues. While in Israel, I worked with Hayas Israel in the first pro bono legal aid program for refugees, as well as with the African Refugee Development Center on various refugee community initiatives. As a result, I am extremely familiar and so proud of the amazing work of our panelists today, and I'm very excited for you to hear from them in just a moment. Before we get started, um, let me note that Partners for Progressive Israel is an American non-for-profit 501c3 organization dedicated to the achievement of a durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors and believes in the need to ensure civil rights, equality, and social justice for all of Israel's inhabitants. Partners seek to deepen Americans and especially American Jews understanding of Israel's complexities in order to enhance their ability to advocate for a progressive Israeli future. Let me now introduce our two panelists for today. Mutasim Ali um, is a co-founder of the African Students Organization in Israel and a former executive director of the African Refugee Development Center in Israel. He is also the first Darfur refugee to be recognized by Israel and given status. Mutasim attended law school in Israel and is currently getting his master's in law at George Washington University. Um, Dr. Tali Kritzman Amir is a visiting associate professor at Harvard University as an Israel Institute Fellowship recipient and a senior lecturer of immigration and international law at the College of Law and Business in Israel. She is one of the leading experts in Israel on immigration and asylum law and policy and has authored dozens of articles on the topic. Um, let me just add that the discussion will go on for about 40 minutes, after which we'll be answering questions from the video audience. I encourage you to type in your questions at any time. All you need to do um, is either run your mouse over your screen or touch your screen and then click on the icon that says Q&A. Um, type your question in the small box that appears. The webinar won't disappear or be disrupted. Please note the viewers' microphones are turned off and questions can only be asked when typed in this way. So um, welcome and I'm very excited to um, moderate this discussion today with two really, really, really phenomenal panelists, um, and let's get started. Um, first, I thought that um, in order to understand a little bit more of the context of who a refugee is, um, what's unique about Israel in this sense, I wanted to ask Tali to start with sort of laying a bit of a foundation for us about who is coming into Israel um, and why, and where do refugees fall within this context? So thank you so much, Kayla, both for moderating and for this excellent question. Um, it's, I think, very important to think about the issue of refugees in Israel in its broader context. And uh, keep in mind that there are also other categories of non-Jewish migrants in Israel. Um, so, for example, Israel has um, about 200,000 um, migrant workers who come to Israel temporarily to work um, in specific sectors such, such as agriculture, uh, construction, and the care sector. Uh, but uh, what we will be focusing on today uh, are the refugees. Um, and we will be loose, using that term uh, quite loosely, even though it's defined in international law. Um, it, most of the people that we will be talking about today were never defined by the state of Israel as refugees. Nevertheless, we talk to them about refugees because um, we believe that substantively they meet the requirements of international law on um, this topic. And what international law says in the convention that was drafted in 1951, um, which Israel was one of the drafting parties to, is that refugees are people who, first of all, cross international border and that um, their migration um, is inspired by a fear of a future looking expectation of persecution and that future looking expectation of persecution needs to be connecting connected according to the definition 
to uh, one of five grounds that's specified in a convention, which are race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. So we have that definition in international law, but um, as we'll say later, Israel has been um, quite reluctant to implement it. Now, once a person is defined as a refugee, then that means that states have obligations towards that person. So unlike migrant workers um, to whom states have a quite a wide discretion on how to treat them, um, there are pretty precise uh, obligations towards refugees um, in international law, the most important of which is the obligation uh, to refrain from refouling them, re refrain from returning them or removing them to a place where their lives or freedom would be jeopardized. So, I mean, I'm oversimplifying things, but I just want to say that we're talking about this particular group of refugees, which is just one of the few groups of uh, non-Jewish migrants that we have in Israel. Thank you. Um, and that actually takes us to um, the topic we want to talk about now, uh, today, about sort of the groups of refugees in Israel. And, and Tassim, I want to turn, I want to, turn to you. Um, but to lay this out, in 2007, the first group of Darfurian refugees arrived in Israel, and they camped out in the Rose Garden across from the Knesset. Um, this was by no means the beginning of the war in Darfur. Um, similarly, the other large group um, of, of refugees who came from Eritrea only began arriving in Israel in 2009. Um, again, the situation in Eritrea that was causing people to, to seek safety elsewhere had started decades earlier. Um, if you could help us understand a little bit why all of a sudden um, refugees started to come into Israel um, and sort of speak specifically about the two main groups who are in Israel. Right. Thank you so much, Kaila. I'm, I'm so glad and excited to be here with you and uh, also speaking to, to, to the audience um, who just joined us. And I think uh, this day has two significance. One, it is um, my actually second day of the snow in my life, so I'm so excited. <laughs> and, uh, and so, number, and number two, this is actually uh, sixth um, year uh, since the biggest march, a refugee march in Tel Aviv to speak up for, um, you know, for basic rights to, um, to be treated in a humane way. Um, and so uh, to your question, you know, um, as we know, most of the refugees and asylum seekers are coming from Sudan, and Eritrea. These are the vast majority of refugees and asylum seekers, right? Uh, of course, there are others from Western African countries, such as Ivory Coast, and there's some from Guinea and a uh, few of well, Nigeria, I would say also. Um, speaking of Sudanese and Eritreans, because these are the two major groups uh, in Israel, uh, Sudanese are primarily coming from war torn zones, primarily from Darfur. Nova Mountains and the Blue Nile. Why these specific regions? Because these are the regions that are, you know, undergoing uh, persecution and oppression. And uh, speaking of Darfur, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with uh, familiar with the issue of Darfur. Uh, it, it started way back, but you know, the major events were basically in 2002, 2003 when the Sudanese central government launched a genocidal campaign to change the racial identity of the region Darfur. Uh, what, do, what do I mean by that? The vast majority of Darfuris are African ethnic groups. And the government wanted to change that racial component from African majority to Arab majority. And that's why we, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen thousands of villages were burned down and uh, people were displaced and hundreds of thousands of refugees. And, uh, and speaking of, you know, uh, refugees in Darfur, or Sudanese refugees in Israel, this is just a small portion of big refugee movement, especially Sudanese uh, in many neighboring countries. I would say there are over 300,000 refugees in Chad 
um, you know, hundreds of thousands of refugees in Cameroon, Central African uh, Republic, Uganda, Ethiopia, and all of these countries. And Israel, of course, um, you know, had it, you know, has its share. Uh, the other group, the other major group uh, is Eritreans. And basically, of course, in Eritrea, there is no war, but then there is, uh, you know, um, you know uh, grave human rights violation and definite, um, you know, um, uh, uh, detention, military conscriptions, um, uh, disappearances, sweep, and all of these issues. And, and that's part of the reason why many Eritreans, uh, you know, leave their countries. And that's why we see a uh, big percentage of Eritreans across the world are being recognized as refugees. Just to give you um, uh, last information about this, there are about 29,600 uh, uh, refugees from um, Africa living in Israel today. Uh, this is like the, the current numbers. Um, it does not include children for sure, but I think, um, you know, uh, it is unfortunate that Israel cannot deal with or cannot handle uh, less than 30,000 refugees living in its borders. And just to, um, and just to follow up with that, the, um, what, what changed that um, refugees started to come specifically into Israel? Because before the destination country, which was often when seeking safety, a lot of um, these groups would end up in Egypt and then from there to other places. But at some, at some point, they started to come into Israel. If you could talk a little bit about that shift and perhaps your own decision right. to come to Israel as well. Um, right, right. So, so, um, so the majority of refugees who made their way to Israel were also, as you said, um, in Egypt or in Libya. And what really happened, and I can tell you um, one example of why a lot of people you know, decided to had to leave and, and, and make it to Israel. Um, so in 2005, uh, there was, uh, this is one of the events, 2005 in Cairo, uh, you know, thousands of Sudanese refugees uh, who actually sought asylum in Cairo because as their first country of arrival, um, you know, uh, they've been waiting there and their rights were violated. Others were uh, sent back because of the diplomatic relationships between Sudanese and Egyptian government, solely because most of the refugees is, are from Darfur, Nova Mountain, Blue Nile, and these groups are labeled by the Sudanese government as Sudanese and actually Egyptian governments as uh, security threats to, uh, to the two countries. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people were subject to deportation, detention, and, um, and also disappearances. Uh, and so, you know, because of those practices, a lot of people gathered in Cairo to protest for their rights, but also to see or ask the United Nations High Commission for Refugees to resettle them because Egypt was not a safe place for them. Apparently what happened is that 29 people were actually killed by the Egyptian security uh, service. And so, and that also applies to Libya because the reason why those countries, Libya and Egypt, I'm speaking specifically these countries, um, and probably some of the uh, other countries like Jordan or uh, Lebanon, uh, we have a lot of people there because uh, you know there are um, uh, you know political or diplomatic relationships, right? And and so that's part of the reason why people were uh, under fear of deportation or even um, um, detention on those countries. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people decided to cross the Mediterranean. Right, a lot of people decided to cross the Mediterranean, and then the other part made their way to Israel. Here are the two main reasons for me personally why I made made it to Israel. One is because of the, um, you know, um, when when the, you know, genocide began in Darfur, and we had the displays, and people, you know, lost everything, their lives, and almost lost half. The only people who were out there to speak of for, you know, uh, for the people of Darfur were basically were primarily. Uh, Jewish diaspora, Jewish movements and synagogues and all of that, given the fact that, you know, uh, Jews have experienced one of, and this is not by activists who protested for Darfur, saved Darfur movement, that we have been there before and we cannot let it ha happen again. We will work with you. And all of these, um, you know, uh, all of those signs and movements were, were sort of giving an impression that Israel would be a safe place because of uh, it's being Jewish state. Um, and the second reason 
is that especially for Sudanese, Israel does not have any diplomatic relationship. So if we fear deportation from Libya or, or, or Jordan or Cairo or um, Egypt, then that would not be the case simply because there is no diplomatic relationship between Sudan and, and Israel to this day. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people had to take that risk to make their way to Israel. And it wasn't that easy really decision to make because in the end you could, we couldn't go to Egyptian embassy or the Israeli embassy in Cairo and ask for permission to make it to Israel. Thank you. Um, as as Mutasa mentioned, there, now there's about tw um, 29,000 refugees um, in Israel, but from, from the time when, when the refugees started to enter in 2007 until around 2012, um, there was a, it was an extreme influx of refugees and it went up to nearly 60,000 people crossing the border. Um, Talia, I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of Israel was a, a drafter of the convention, of the refugee convention. They were committed to the ideals of, of safety for Jewish people. Um, and um, all of a sudden we're tasked to sort of figure out how do we deal with um, asylum seekers from non-Jewish countries. Um, and I think there's an interesting perspective from the beginning of when Israel started to deal with this and the general attitudes towards people who are coming in and how that sort of started to shift um, pretty dramatically, which manifested in some pretty terrible policies. Um, but maybe if you could paint a little bit of a picture of sort of the struggle of Israel having to sort of create policies and legal mechanisms and justice systems to sort of how to cope with um, with the uh, influx of refugees. Yeah, so uh, I've mentioned before that Israel was one of the drafters of the 1951 convention. Um, and at the time, Israel had an interest in a convention because the idea was that the convention would probably protect uh, Jewish refugees in the post-World War II era. Uh, but uh, the historical research about Israel at, at that time suggests that Israel didn't actually think that it would be in a position to have to take non-Jewish refugees in. So uh, for many years, this issue was kind of dormant and, and kind of not really treated within Israel. What we have seen in, in the first years um, was a few uh, sort of humanitarian gestures. So. Uh, refugees were um, accepted into the Israeli society, but sort of outside the refugee convention as gestures and, and demonstrations of goodwill on behalf of Israel. But um, what we haven't seen was an actual implementation of the legal obligation. Now, as you said, in this, um, the mid 2000s, that began to be an issue. Um, and initially, it, Israel didn't even have a, a process and a bureaucracy that's needed to deal with um, asylum applications and so on. So initially uh, what happened was that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, was interviewing refugees and making uh, recommendations about their cases um, to the Israeli Ministry of Interior. That has changed in 2009 when the numbers of uh, people coming in grew so significantly. Um, and that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is really struggling to um, interview them all. And um, since 2009, Israel sort of took over that process of interviewing um, asylum seekers and making determinations on their cases in, in, in an independent manner, much like other states are um, doing. Um, however, what hasn't changed was the sort of like the, the philosophical framework. And the philosophical framework is that Israel is not a migration state, that um, Israel is a Jewish state, and uh, therefore uh, refugees who are not Jewish are not um, welcomed. And what we have seen um, throughout the years was um, the creation of a pretty elaborate system of exclusion directed towards non-Jewish refugees, um, which I imagine we'll, we'll talk um, about in the time that we have left. I'm, I'm happy to uh, elaborate, but um, you might also want to ask us some more questions. So. Um. Thank you. Um, Mutasim, would, do, you, do you want to talk about that as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, there are always a lot of things to say, of course, uh, about Israel's, uh, you know, 
uh, is a person and totally agree that you know um, we have never felt being welcome in Israel, right? Because you know, um, for many reasons, of course. But again, uh, looking at the policy, I'm sure Tad will expand on that. Uh, you know, all the policies until today are exclusionary uh, policies, right? From you know, from limiting refugees not to live in certain areas uh, to uh, to um, detention facility, the whole lot detention facility when it was, it was erected in 2013, and um, you know, uh, thousands of uh, refugees from Sudan. Mainly, these two groups were detained solely to make their lives miserable, so that they could leave Israel voluntarily. Um, and we can also expand on that more. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there are really, uh, you know, so many uh, parts. And again, you know, um, it, on, on the other hand, there is no, um, uh, you know, uh, processing to the asylum claims right like you could apply for asylum today and you can wait indefinitely without having you know the government deciding upon your asylum claim so on one hand the government maintains an exclusionary policy to push people out of the country and on that hand even those who apply for asylum they do not get uh you know uh interviews or have their asylum claims processed uh, i'm sure you know uh, i'll leave that spell for, for sure to expand on that uh, um uh, uh, happy to add more great so maybe um, maybe if, if it's okay i can uh, i can extend on that um for sure. if, um so i think first and foremost what um what israel does to um exclude asylum seekers is um it erected a wall along the egyptian border which was um, the longest continental uh, border with Africa and before 2013 was um, without any physical barrier. Um, and since 2013, what we've seen is that this is probably the most effective wall in the whole world uh, because the numbers of people go going into Israel just really dropped to zero. Um, and um, so that's, that's the first mechanism. First of all, trying to keep refugees out of the state once they are in Israel. The second mechanism that was used was putting people in immigration detention. And when that was challenged in court, um, Israel created the residency centers, so to speak, which were essentially very similar to the detention facilities. Um, another uh, exclusionary effort that um, Israel carried out in the last a uh, couple of years was to try to transfer people to third countries. So Israel realized that the people cannot be sent back to their country of origin. Um, so what it does in, instead was um, to uh, create uh, third country agreements, very similar to the ones that the U.S. is currently uh, engaged in, to transfer um, refugees to third countries. Um, and those two were challenged in court and um, received significant significant pushback from the civil society and ultimately uh, the attempts to deport people by force to those third countries which were Rwanda and Uganda um, were um, stopped. Um, in, in addition, there's, um, Mutasim mentioned this just, just now, there's a bureaucratic um, exclusion. So asylum applications can be pending for a decade or more. Just yesterday I spoke with a woman whose asylum application uh, is pending for 17 years, and uh, she has yet to um, hear back a decision on her case. Um, the um, temporary visas that asylum seekers are uh, given while their asylum applications are pending give them a very partial access to rights, and they constantly need to renew them. Um, so they have this experience of constantly waiting in line to get their papers uh, renewed. Um, and um, there's also the economic exclusion. Um, since May 2017, mostly, um, Israel enacted the deposit law, which um, imposes an obligation on employers to divert 20% of the salary uh, of asylum seekers to a deposit that's made available to them when they leave Israel, which of course, for many of them, is not a real possibility. Um, and uh, on top of all that, there's also the social exclusion. Um, in uh, many aspects, asylum seekers in Israel are really transparent. 
um, are really struggling to integrate into the Israeli society with everything else that they're going in going through uh, in it. Um, and um, then they also um, are um, targeted by politicians in Israel. Um, the, the most famous uh, incident was in 2012 when um, Miri Regev, who is now the Minister of Cultural Affairs, referred to Sudanese refugees as the, the cancer in our bodies. Uh, but we've had many more um, statements along that um, line. So uh, we have all those pretty elaborate systems of exclusion working together um, and creating um, a pretty uh, unbearable situation for the refugees in Israel. Thank you. Before we continue, I just want to remind our audience to um, type in some questions. Um, you just need to go to the bottom of your monitor and um, click on Q&A um, and um, click on the icon and type your question in the small box that appears. And this will not disrupt anything, um, but important to get those in there so that we can ask your questions um, soon. Um, I wanted to um, touch a little bit on what you just said, Tali, about sort of um, refugees integration into um, Israeli society, and, and, and there's been some really astounding um, grassroots work as well within the community. Um, and um, Mutasim, you've been involved in, um, in a, a lot of that um, through the ARDC and through the um, ASO, and um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the initiatives that, that have taken place within the community and also the partnerships that were formed with Israelis on the ground and internationals who were, who were volunteering in Israel um, and sort of with institutions and how those partnerships played out in helping um, refugees sort of take part in civil society despite all of the, um, the countless um, things stacked against them. Right. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you so much about that. I want to begin with uh, a slight uh, comment on what, uh, you know, Tali mentioned about exclusion of policies. And I think, you know, just to make sure that everybody's following with us, um, you know, there is, uh, as Tali mentioned, there's like an economic exclusion, deportation, detention, bureaucracy, xenophobia, and actually, you know, a um, couple of days ago, there was like a sort of flood in Tel Aviv. And the mayor of Tel Aviv actually blamed refugees and asylum seekers, saying, um, you know, the, the problem with South Tel Aviv is not the infrastructure, but the infiltrators. This is the mayor of Tel Aviv. And this is just uh, about three days when there was a flood in Tel Aviv. And so this is a part of the rhetoric that is going on in Israel, which makes uh, a lot harder for refugees to be here. Now, just to be clear, all of these, you know, exclusionary policies are not unique, I have to say. Uh, speaking of economic um, exclusion, deposit loan, all of that, it, you know, uh, Denmark also maintains, you know, economic exclusion, deportation, many countries deport, uh, including the United States. Um, detention, Australia also detains people, and there are many examples of that. But I think what is unique about the Israeli exclusionary policy is like combines all of these together. And so it makes it really, really uh, hard for refugees. And that's part of the reason why we see, uh, you know, a uh, number of refugees uh, had, to, you know, to, seek, uh, to, flee, to leave Israel and seek asylum again. Um, and so that's one thing. Speaking of a partnership and the work that we've done in the community, I think, you know, just taking my experience with two organizations, African Refugee Development Center, it's like sort of a, a community-based organization, the idea that, uh, you, know, um, you know, Israelis and asylum seekers came together to help uh, confront the, the arrival of refugees and asylum seekers because the government does not offer any assistance to this day. Um, and so what happened is that, you know, you know, uh, under, you know with ARDC, like African Refugee Development Center in the beginning, the idea was to offer humanitarian assistance, providing shelter, um, food, and all of these uh, things. But then when they erected the fence uh, in 2012 and no more refugees are coming, you know, we shifted our mission from offering humanitarian assistance to advocacy, right? Like to how can we influence policy? How can we work together with local residents specifically most of, I mean, one of the projects that was uh, really inspired by was, you know, power to community. The idea was to bring refugees and asylum seekers and the local residents to get the one 
one thing that we have, you know, we all acknowledge is that the, the, the condition of the uh, local residents in South Tel Aviv, primarily five main neighborhoods, Hatikva, uh, Nabe Shanan, Florentine, Kiryat Shalom, and all of these neighborhoods, they really endure a miserable situation. Um, comparing them to other neighborhoods, uh, they're totally ignored and abandoned by the government. And so, you know, we, you know, we created this project to say that, hey, we acknowledge your pain, your suffering, and we can work together to address these issues, right? Because the government is not doing its, you know, it's not, you know, taking its responsibility on handling these issues. In fact, it is, you know, tr doing everything possible to put these two populations um, and fight each other. Uh, and so, under that project, we were able really to conduct several meetings and visit, uh, home visits or patrols and uh, to address the issue of insecurity and all of that. But again, it's like a very limited capacity. It does not, it didn't help to solve the issue of refugees, but at least it was an initiative that brings refugees and local residents together. The other thing, um, you know, my, my, myself and the others who were able to go to Israeli you know, universities, we came up with the initiative that, uh, you know, how can we, you know, help the rest of the community, or at least those who aspire to access, you know, Israeli universities to complete their educations, um, you know, how can we help them to, to do so? Because we, we've had the opportunity, we didn't have the status when we applied for universities, but we were able to do it, like we were able to apply for universities. And so we created an organization Afri uh, called African Students Organization, and the idea is, again, to help our friends from the community to go to universities. This is number one thing. And number two, but also to serve as an advocacy organization that just, you know, pool, crime, people who seek assistance and uh, we need to give them shelter and food. But people have aspirations just like anybody else, right? Like when we have dreams to achieve. And in fact, many of us were involved with issues back home. And so education was, uh, is one way to influence both situation in Israel and back home. And I, I think I just, I just want to emphasize here that um, the, the communities of refugees sort of have spent, especially through the African Refugee Development Center, which um, Mutasim was once the executive director of and Tali served on the board of, um, they provided a lot of language classes and um, a lot of the refugee community speaks fluent Hebrew now and their children are enrolled in Israeli schools and speak Hebrew and um, and more and more higher education is becoming more and more accessible um, to the refugee community. Um, I wanted to um, go back to um, the actual asylum process. Um, Tali, you um, mentioned before about sort of the convention and the obligations and everything like that. And um, I, I think that it's a, I think that when looking at the situation in Israel, it is, it's a confusing contradiction um, because there's this, ob there's this obvious obligation um, and then this sort of mess of a situation. Um, and the, the, maybe you can talk a little bit about the connection between um, what Israel's obligations were on the convention and whether or not they're, they're actually not, not following those obligations or are they sort of finding all of these loopholes um, and sort of other ways to get around um, standing up to their international obligations. So I think part of the effort of the Israeli government and Kremlin in, in the last few years was to sort of walk on a very fine line uh, and find the middle grounds of, on the one hand, not granting any rights to uh, the refugees, and on the other hand, um, not being um, portrayed as uh, violators of international law. But I think um, the accumulation uh, of all the exclusionary practices um, does paint a picture of a country that is evading its obligation under uh, refugee law. Now, the thing is with the, uh, the convention relating to the status of refugees from 1951, um, is that first of all, it's really vague um, and the requirements from a state um, are really, um, were really drafted in a very vague language. Um, so for example, when uh, states are supposed to um, naturalize refugees, the, the, the convention 
required to facilitate to the extent possible that, that naturalization. So for Israel, that means, for example, that no refugee will ever um, be able to obtain a permanent status in, in Israel, and they will forever be in this um, prolonged temporariness uh, situation. Um, so, so that's one way Israel was able to um, evade its obligations through that very vague language of the convention. But then on the other hand, um, we should also keep in mind the fact that the refugee convention doesn't really have an enforcement mechanism. So um, when Israel does violate it, there's nothing that actually happens except for um, you know, the, the international uh, cry out um, and protest. Um, but there are no actual tangible um, implications of, of those violations. To me, um, it seems that Israel is definitely violating the spirit of the convention. I would also um, say that it's, it's violating specific elements. I think that by making the lives of refugees in Israel so unbearable, Israel is virtually pushing refugees out of the country um, to uh, places where their lives uh, are at danger. And we've actually seen it, um, that people have left Israel and went um, on, onwards um, and have reached Libya uh, and either died or found themselves in, in grave dangers. So I, I would definitely say that there are violations here. But the thing is there's uh, virtually no enforcement. Um, there's not much that is, is being done as a result. Um, we're, we're very soon going to turn to questions um, from the audience. So take a moment and write in your question now. Um, we, would love to address any anything that comes to mind. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the the word solutions is always uh, <laughs> a funny one in this in this context um, because um, it, it it is a very unique situation as as both Tali and Mutasim have explained. Um, refugees really aren't coming into the country anymore dealing with a group that's already been there for a very long time, that don't have a status that allows them to really travel. Leaving Israel by foot is, is almost impossible. Um, and, um, and so there's sort of this um, dealing, dealing with this group um, and sort of trying to think creatively about policies that would help them, sort of encourage them to, um, encourage them to leave. So, the, the, the question, and, and I think that what we've seen over the past couple of years, a lot of, a lot of uh, um, members of the refugee community um, who have, um, who were sort of, you know, leaders in the grassroots movement and, um, you know, speak Hebrew and Mutasim, I mean, this is, um, you, I mean, but don't necessarily um, see a future for themselves there anymore. Um, and there's an increasingly people are looking for opportunities to leave because um, the, it's just sort of policy after policy, um, which basically says don't, don't stay here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious for both of your thoughts on this. Um, you know, are we are, are looking at a time where it's sort of it's just going to trickle and trickle and trickle until everybody leaves and then we've, you know, we don't necessarily have a solved policy issue, you know, Israel will just not deal with asylum cases, um, or are we looking at um, hopefully sort of small steps um, towards a hopefully um, better system in the future? Mutasim, um, why don't we start with you? All right, thanks. Um, this is actually one of the most difficult questions right now, um, because this, you know, um, in the beginning, it was a lot of yeah, to handle the issue of refugees and asylum seekers, right? Uh, but then because of um, the xenophobic, uh, you know, uh, xenophobia and, uh, you know, labeling refugees and infiltrators, work infiltrators, in fact, uh, you know, dehumanizing the community and makes them feel like they're not, you know, belonging to Israel, it's becoming really difficult, even from refugees part to be in Israel, right? Um, but it's still, I, I want to be hopeful as well. Um, you know, in 2018, there was um, a deal that was actually signed between the Israeli government, uh, Netanyahu's government, and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. The substance of the deal was to sort of half of refugees, then it was about six, uh, 16,200 people to settle them to 
um, you know, um, third countries. Um, it wasn't divide, uh, defined specifically what those, uh, you know, third countries are, but the indications were basically Western countries. Um, and the other half will remain in Israel to be able to settle in Israel being given, um, you know, a durable status to remain in Israel and live and work uh, live in a dignified way. Unfortunately, less than a day, Benjamin Netanyahu counseled the deal, only because some of the local residents who were politically motivated uh, protested and said, this is like a bad deal, and none of them, so the deal was counseled. Um, so I really hope, I mean, you know, that deal will be reinstated. Though the United Nations High Commission for Appeals, this says, yes, we are prepared to do that again. Uh, I don't know. Uh, how likely it is the Israeli government will do so. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know if Netanyahu's government is willing to do that after the elections. Um, but, 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 but we're looking forward to see what's going to happen. But again, I have to say for, for you know, not necessarily speaking for all, all the what you just in Israel, but I can tell you a lot of people just want to leave Israel. And this is not only because of his status, but because of the way that people are being treated, being referred to as criminals, as rapists, and all of that. And so it will be humanizing and pejorative, and that's part of the reason why a lot of people want to seek uh, another safe place. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to turn to the Q&A for a moment. Um, this is a question from um, an anonymous attendee. Um, thank you for your work. Um, I get that right-wing Israeli politicians like to demonize the refugees, but how do regular Israelis react to this? Do they buy into the scare tactics? And how do the centrist and left-wing parties relate to this issue? Um, Tali, would you like to take that one? Um, sure. Um, so I think, um, the answer is that it depends. I think some people do buy um, into the scare tactics, but I also think a lot of people don't. And I think um, Mutasim described the attempt um, in 2018 to deport people to Rwanda and Uganda. Um, and um, that, that was a very sad moment for me as an Israeli um, to see what my, my government was trying to do, but it was also a very a hopeful and encouraging moment to see how the population of the state of Israel responded. Um, in the protests uh, to the deportation plans, we saw tens of thousands of people going out to the streets, marching alongside with asylum seekers against the deportation. So I'm not saying that all of those um, tens of thousands of people have a concrete idea of how they want to see refugees integrated into the Israeli society or anything like that, but these are people who are willing, you know, to, to take the time and um, get out there. And it's not very comfortable necessarily to protest in Israel and so on. But um, these were people who were willing to go out there and say that this should not be done in their name. Um, and um, that's, that's something that I think is really ho hopeful. I also think that there are so many um, non-governmental organizations um, both of asylum seekers and Israelis um, that are, you know, in, investing so much of their time, effort, and expertise in assisting um, asylum seekers in Israel that that's also really encouraging. Um, we see some support from the political parties, but not um, a whole lot of it. Um, mostly um, the joint list and Meret have been um, uh, on board with asylum seekers' rights issues. But um, politically speaking, um, it's uh, not perceived to be very wise to side with um, asylum seekers' rights issues. Um, asylum seekers cannot vote, uh, so they don't have any political power. Um, and on the other side, um, there are uh, people who, who think about this issue as very controversial. So um, a lot of the political parties are just you know, sort of staying out of this um, issue altogether. Um, Mutasim, would you um, like to comment a little bit about sort of yeah. um, collaborations and, and sort of work that you've done with communities um, in, 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 on, on that regard? Yeah, sure. Um, so just speaking of the, you know, um, you know, average Israeli and uh, the rhetoric and all of that, I, I can tell you, like, um, there, as Tali mentioned, there are a lot of people 
a lot of Israelis who support the cause of refugees and asylum seekers who were able to partner, right? Not, I'm not only speaking of organizations, human rights organizations, right? They are often labeled as left. And so, uh, you know, our partnership extends even with the Israeli people, right? Like, uh, let's say, a um, Houthi movement in South Tel Aviv, which is sort of a feminist Mizrahi uh, organization in South Tel Aviv for the rights of local residents, right? And so, you know, there are a lot of projects. Part of the reason why we were able to have a big protest in February 2018 that Tali was speaking of about, you know, um, almost 20,000 people came to the protest, and that's because of that partnership. Uh, but again, the question of whether, you know, um, the majority of Israelis support the asylum seekers or not, that's really a difficult answer. But I think my, 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 my belief is that the vast majority of Israelis are buying into the government's policy, right? Um, you know, um, there are people who just believe these are not refugees, they're infiltrators, they're here to destroy our society. This is something that we hear all all the time, everywhere, and um, and uh, but you know, uh, once again, we really do not have many options other than working with those who can, you know, are willing to discuss this because there are a lot of people. There are some people just unwilling to even talk about this. Um, uh, and so our partnerships uh, are primarily with those who are willing to speak, willing to listen. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, having conversations and debates and all of that and um, organize events where possible. And, uh, but in the end, we've been doing that. And I have to say this like uh, with uh, honesty, we've been doing this for many years. Like uh, since I've involved with these issues, it was 2010. Now it's up, up to 10 years since I started involving with the issue of mobilizing the local residents and refugees to work together and partner all of that, yet we do not see, because in the end, the idea of this part, you know, a policy that would be good for all, be good for refugees, but also for the local residents, for, uh, specifically in South Tel Aviv. Did we make change? Unfortunately not, because the situation is actually getting worse, at least from the end of refugees and asylum seekers. People are still being deported voluntarily. People are still do not have the status. The government is not even willing to process the claims, and so it's, it's still the same things that we were speaking of, uh, you know, back in days when the first of you just decided to arrive. Um, in fact, it's even worse today. Thank you. Um, another question um, is: um, What is or will be the status of children of refugees born in Israel? Um, Tali, can I come to you on this? Sure. Um, so Israel doesn't have birthright citizenship. Um, so unlike the U.S., um, non-citizen uh, children, children of non-citizens will not be uh, citizens just by the virtue of being born um, in Israel. So um, children of refugees and migrant workers are um, undocumented, basically. Um, in the case of uh, children of refugees, um, they are dependent on their parents' um, asylum application, which, as we've mentioned before, could take, you know, 10, 15 years to um, even be processed. Um, what we've seen in the uh, um, last uh, few uh, months is an attempt to uh, deport children who are undocumented with their families, but that was an attempt that was focused more on the children of the migrant workers. It's still um, something I find really concerning. Another development of the last uh, few um, days is the decision of the Tel Aviv municipality to um, open a, a school for um, the foreign children, as they call them. Um, and that uh, school is supposed to be um, opened on the only um, park that is still available in South Tel Aviv. So not only is this a decision that um, suggests deepening or entrenching the segregation in education and sending um, non-national kids to uh, separate schools, this is also something that has a, such a direct cost for um, the local residents of South Tel Aviv that uh, in itself is not something that will encourage uh, the residents of South Tel Aviv uh, to be more tolerant towards the Italian-speaking population, 
Um, so that's something that I find um, really um, concerning and problematic. Um, there's a, um, a comment here from um, David Abraham. Um, he says, strategically, it seems to me there's some confusion or ambivalence between, on the one hand, playing the Jewish card based on our own tragic experience, we should be generous towards the persecuted, and on the other hand, stressing the normality and success of Israel that should enable it to be comfortable taking some refugees from around the world. Um, I think it's actually a, a, an important comment. Um, maybe um, Tali can continue with this a little bit, um, just sort of the idea of um, you know, t t not taking all the refugees, but actually taking some, is that even a, in the, a possibility for Israel, but maybe. Um, yeah, I think the question for Israel to deal with is what is um, the lesson or the moral lesson that we're learning from our past? Um, one way to sort of formulate that lesson is to say never again for anyone. And another way is to say never again for us. Um, and I think the, the strategic choice of the current Israeli government, and unfortunately the, the governments that came before as well, uh, was to uh, formulate the question, the, the, the lesson as never again for us. Um, and for some people that meant excluding non-Jewish migrants, um, including non-Jewish refugees. Um, to me, that's really not the lesson that we should be learning. Now, especially since Israel is located in, in that region where it's located, right? I mean, we're right next to Syria um, with everything that Syria is going through. We're right next to Lebanon um, that has been shouldering such a significant um, portion of the responsibility. Jordan, Turkey, all the countries in this region are either um, in um, massive turmoil or um, shouldering uh, much more uh, significant portions of their responsibility towards refugees in the world. And then we have the state of Israel which currently has just about um, 30,000 refugees at hand. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty economically stable country. It's um, a, a democracy. Um, and, and yet it's struggling to uh, provide rights and protection to 30,000 people. You know, I mean, for me as an Israeli, that's something that I'm, I'm really not proud of. Um, and for me, as someone whose family has survived the Holocaust, that, that's not um, the lesson we should have learned from, from this experience. Um, Mutasa, would you like to comment on that yeah. at all? Yeah, sure. A very quick comment. Um, I think, you know, just for, you know, taking the last part of the comment that was made uh, by David, I think um, I totally agree that was, um, you know, uh, what Tali uh, said, but I think there's one thing. Um, and as we're not speaking of daily influx, not daily arrival of refugees and asylum seekers, because the fence was already erected and actually from 2018 to 2019, zero people, uh, 19 zero people entered Israel, right? Like we're not speaking of taking more refugees. We we're speaking of how can we handle those who are already within the territories of Israel, and this is only 29,000, you know, um, 600 people that Israel can, as Tali said, the economic power and actually, you know, the government and Netanyahu particularly always brags about how powerful uh, the state of Israel is, and indeed it's true. I agree with him, and I think it is capable of taking 20, uh, 29,000 refugees and asylum seekers. So there shouldn't be a fear of, you know, um, you know, resettling those uh, already in Israel. This is number one thing. Number two, um, you know, uh, and unlike other countries, right, uh, Israel, uh, you know, even if you grant to refugees that is to citizenship in Israel, because citizenship, you, to be a citizen in Israel, you have to be a Jewish. And so, you know, I have the refugee status, but I do not have any chance to be a citizen of Israel. And I don't complain about that because in the end for me, the goal is not to be a citizen. The goal is to, in the end just to, you know, to have a safe shelter until I'm able to be back to my home. Thank you. Um, and there's one more question. Um, here. Um, it, a little bit abroad, but um, 
can you give a moment? Um, can you give us a sense of how this issue is being handled in other countries compared to Europe, for instance, and also in terms of US policy? Um, Ali? <laughs> yeah, so, so it's sort of broad, but um, I'll try to give some highlights, maybe. Um, so I think a lot of the aspects of the policies in Israel are really not unique to Israel. We've seen other countries uh, erecting border fences. We've seen other countries detaining um, asylum seekers. Um, but I think um, there are two things that are um, different um, with Israel. First of all, there are like tiny adjustments that Israel makes that um, make all of those mechanisms really um, difficult. So, for example, with respect to um, immigration detention, so, um, you know, small things like not um, detaining just the people who uh, just enter the country, but also detaining people who have been in the country sometimes for, you know, a decade or so, um, that is something that is, is, is pretty unusual in a comparative sense. Um, the border fence I've mentioned before is the most um, effective, so to speak, border fence um, in the world. But, you know, part of it has to do with our geopolitical situation because of the fact that it's located right near Gaza and it's so heavily militarized in a way that few countries um, can. Um, but what I think really makes Israel stand out is the fact that um, it applies all of these exclusionary mechanisms together. You know, the fact that there is that border fence, the immigration detention, um, third country agreements, um, and the very low recognition rates combined with the economic exclusion and the 20% deduction from the salary, the bureaucratic hurdles that people have to cross, and the um, strong xenophobic language, all of those uh, really make um, Israel stand out, the, the, that mere combination of uh, factors. I do have to say, though, that um, the Israeli Supreme Court has been quite active. Um, in um, sort of pushing back some of uh, these initiatives. Uh, and, and at the same time, that sort of backfired on the court, um, and the court is um, now in a really difficult position that the legitimacy of the court is um, sort of questioned because of the many uh, times that the court has struck down policies towards asylum seekers in Israel. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that's, we're coming to a close. Um, thank you to everybody who um, submitted questions. Um, maybe I just, maybe one more minute um, to come back to our panelists. Um, Utasim, would you like to just 30 yeah. seconds? Yeah, well, I mean, um, <laughs> I sort of, uh, um, there, there were uh, two questions. So I sort of wanna see that just to feel like, you know, um, not to miss anyone, like the two main things, and I'm going to do that very fast. Um, I'm starting with uh, Marcia Yerman. Um, so she was asking a really import, uh, important question about the alliance or, you know, struggle, if there is a connection between refugees struggle and migrant workers in the Philippines and all of that. Unfortunately, we haven't done that because we, we, we believe that we have totally separate issues. We, uh, you know, uh, we, we did not, you know, come to Israel in a regular way. And so um, I was just completely different. We also claim persecution for political reasons and all of that. Of course, um, you know, the way they're treated in certain extent, um, similar to ours, but our issues are completely different. This is number one thing. Number two, um, you know, migrant workers have work permits, right? Like they come to Israel under contracts and so they have really valid visas and here's one thing that i want to say in the end that most of refugees and asylum seekers do not have work permits right like they have conditional release visa that they have to renew uh, every um you know month or or, or um once in, in in two months for instance let's say this is like the one of the you know just a piece of paper and it says clearly it does not constitute a work permit this is one of the issues but in the end to conclude my remarks um for example uh, first of all, I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation. There are a lot of things, of course, you know, this issue is so broad and so big and we cannot, you know, cover everything in this, you know, short meeting, but I hope for the future conversations we'll be able to expand this more. Uh, I do believe that there are a lot of good people, um, Israelis, but also people in diaspora, right? Like they made, like people in diaspora made a, a gigantic difference, especially during the deportation campaign. 
and your involvement makes a big difference. Like now, the one of the reasons why we do not see active deportation of refugees and asylum seekers because of the campaigns. One of the reasons why, and I actually forgot to say this, there are a number of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, dozens of Darfurists who were granted, you know, uh, sort of temporary residency status. And because of the, you know, Israeli government sort of embarrassed by the fact that, hey, we have Darfurists in our land and yet they don't have the status. And, you know, Jewish diaspora protested for many years for the, for the of, and now the Israeli, uh, the Israeli government does not give the status to Darfur. So that's, um, because of your advocacy, some of the Darfur's are able to receive the status. And so what I'm trying to say in the end is that your involvement, your, your engagement with this issue for the good of Israel, but also for the good of asylum seekers can make a big difference. Thank you so much. Um, Hallie, would you like to say 15 seconds of a conclusion? Or? Yeah. I couldn't agree more with Mutasim. I think um, that a lot of us might feel discouraged from um, dealing with the um, Israeli-Palestinian issue. I think this is one issue that is really uh, easy to resolve. It's a very small population that Israel could easily um, take in and accept um, and could actually benefit from. Um, a lot of the asylum seekers could actually be um, really um, contributing uh, members of the Israeli society. So it could really um, be something that works for the mutual benefit of everyone. But thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity to talk about it now. And, and we're really looking forward to your future involvement in this topic. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for joining us for this conversation with Israel and Palestine. I want to thank our panelists, Utasim Ali and Dr. Tali Kutzmiyami. Um, also, thank you to the staff of Partners for Progressive Israel for their work in making this discussion happen. Um, you can go to progressiveisrael.org to learn more about Partners for Progressive Israel and their future programs. Um, thank you all for your questions and participation. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.